there are times when you do need that hand to come on your shoulder and go, don't give in. You've got this. You're not alone. We're walking with you. You're going to come through this and you're going to blossom. And the way that you get that is you ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. Today, we are elated to share a Patreon podcast supporter episode with author, occultist, magical teacher, and tarot expert, Josephine McCarthy. So how can we ask spirits to guide us on our fate paths? How can we give offerings to land spirits without expecting anything in return? And why is honeycomb such a good offering? And what really is astral projection? Well, Josephine McCarthy is one of the best people to ask, and I cannot thank supporters of the Glitch Bottle podcast on Patreon.com enough for asking Josephine so many amazing questions. I'm always so honored to speak with and learn from Josephine, who is based in the UK and has been active in magic for more than 40 years. Josephine has authored dozens of books on magic and is also the director of Quaria, a free online magical training course that takes participants from apprentice to adept. Josephine also has a new deck and book out as well, so please make sure to check that out too. And I hope you appreciate Josephine's time and wisdom as much as I do on so many different topics. And these issues are explored and covered based on the Patreon listener questions that were sent in. And Josephine leaves us with so many powerful reminders to help us cultivate magical and mental health. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back Josephine McCarthy. So Josephine, as well, we have so many listener questions for you because you really do, I think, stimulate and inspire people to take a look at their own practice, their own lives, and then find out how that maps onto what they'd like to accomplish and help others and have service. The first listener question we have for you, Josephine, is from Michelle Rella Summers, who is asking and saying, Yay, I love Josephine's talks. I've been slowly making my way through the Apprentice book of the Quaria course for the past five years, and I'm almost through all of the material. Whew, my question is a bit strange, but I'll ask it anyways. I'm in a 12-step program for addiction to marijuana, and one of the steps that I turn my will and my life over to the care of a power greater than myself. I struggle with this, Michelle says, because it feels a bit like that Catholic rhetoric I was raised with. However, it also makes sense because addiction is a strong power that kicks my ass. So having a big sister to protect me from the schoolyard bully, so to speak, makes sense. Currently, I'm trying to reconcile what the 12-step program is asking me to do with my practice as a witch. And so Michelle, Josephine is asking, do you have any thoughts on the matter? And thank you for all you do. Hi, Michelle. Firstly, it's it's really good that you're marching your way through that process because that takes a lot of guts and determination and really deserves admiration because it's very tough. And I can see the issue with the Catholic background and the high higher power stuff because, you know, not just in Catholicism, but, you know, in, in any of the Abrahamic religions, unless you're in one of the mystical arms of it, is the image of God is as a man an anthropomorphic being or a Zeus, basically, that's where the Catholic or Christian image of God comes from is, you know, the long hair, the beard, the throne and the whole thing is is Zeus. And that just, everything that goes with that is so unhealthy for a start off in magical terms, in religious terms, in all of it, because it just, that's not right. It doesn't exist. So the first thing is, is to, yeah, as you said, toss all of that Catholic stuff out the window because divinity is way more complex than that. It isn't human or human-esque. It has no gender. It's a consciousness we just cannot understand, but it's consciousness that flows through everything and that everything springs from all the deities, the beings, the car, you, the tree, everything. 
comes from this coherent consciousness that's a power. So that in itself is also very difficult in the situation that you're in to latch onto. However, if you've been doing the choreo training, or for people in, in a similar position that are listening who are pagans, witches, occultists, you know, animists, anything like that, through your choreo training, if you've worked your way through the apprentice book, you'll have worked with beings in the directions, you'll have worked with land beings, you'll have worked with one or two deities, you'll have been introduced to lots of different types of beings, including your own ancestors at the end. What you have to do is step back first and understand what is it that you actually need. And you've partly got to that of having the big sister to protect you. And which is right. And in the the courier training in the apprentice section, you do pick up or become aware of first your own daemon, a being that is very highly tied into you from conception. But you'll also become aware of other beings that you've worked with and that you've communicated with. And you basically ask, you can open up all the gates, the four gates, Go around them, tell them what you're doing and tell them that you need a big sister or brother or a being. You need an advisor, a friend, a guardian to help you specifically through this process, because that then enables if you if you bring in the process, whenever you're talking with inner beings, you've got to be very clear about what you want. Don't assume that they know you're going through a 12 step process you do need someone there, a mentor, a protector to help you, especially when you're going through, you know, you fall down a dark hole sometimes or you just can't cope with it and it just becomes overwhelming where there's some being. People will say, I want a specific, send me an angel, send me this, send me that. You don't know what you need. That's why you're in the situation that you are. You're, You're trying to come out of a situation where you didn't have power over something. So the automatic reaction is to try and gain power, which can be counterproductive to start with. What you need is guidance and someone to catch you when you fall. So you go around the directions and, you know, if someone's working in a different magical system, use a system, whatever it is, where it brings together a physical action and an inner action that triggers contact. In Quarrier, that's opening the gates of the directions and communing with the beings that come up to the threshold. Go around, tell them what you need. Just say, for this time that I'm going through this, however long or short it would be, I need help. I need a companion and a guardian, someone to help me when I fall down, someone to advise me and give me a heads up, not to do the work for me, but to help me when I can't help myself or when I've reached my limit. And what will happen is, and you might need to do that two or three times as a, as a, a ritual action over a few days or a week until the message gets through. And then you pay attention because what will come to you is what you need. If you need an inner contact, that will turn up and it will connect with you in the best way that you connect with stuff. So it could be through dreams, through your visionary work, you know, through things talking to you. It could be a person that turns up. The idea being, this is not the higher power. This is the companion first. That's important. And then when it comes to the higher power, you work in the directions. You've got an inner assistant and then you, you think about what do you trust? Everyone in magic, you know, has a connection to divinity, unless they're atheist. If they're an atheist magician, they, it's themselves, which is just as valid. It can be your very deeper self. It can be your daemon, which is what some people call a holy guardian angel. Or it can be a goddess or a god, a deity. It can be a spirit, a land spirit, some of them are incredibly powerful. Divinity flows through all of those things, including yourself. 
you know, the divine power that is greater than yourself is within you and it's all around you. But it needs a form that you can work with and a form that you can work with when you're in distress, because that's when all theory and everything else goes out the window. What is left is this core of who you are and and where your mind, it's not about belief, it's where your mind plugs in to the divine. And so like in Quarry, that's why it's open to people of all different religions and none, because the whole process works the same. And as you know, in the course, you come across all different sorts of things, but I never talk about what mine is. Mine is different. I have my divine connection through something, through a deity. And that's my, in inverted commas, religion. It's not a belief. It's a partnership. And it works. And that's what you need to find. So in terms of reconciling this higher power, be aware that when that was all first, the 12-step program, when that was put together, it was put together in a Christian community, as in America is a Christian community, whether you're a Christian or not. That was its foundation of society. And for the majority of people, that's how their minds think, even if they're not religious. So, for example, in China, people think in a very different way. In the Islamic communities, people think in very different ways. So you've just got to be aware of that. And be aware of that's why it's there, because it grew in a Christian society. And that is the vessel and frontage that that community worked with. But the power that comes through that vessel of Christianity is not a Christian power, and it's not a Muslim power, and it's not an atheist power. It's power, consciousness, divinity, the thing we can't understand, which is why we have deities and spirits they, it comes through as filters so that we can commune. And if you think back to when I was talking about when God turned up for his painting doing, see how even the language turns it into a male straight away. But when I did the painting, I couldn't understand what it was and I couldn't understand why I couldn't understand what it was. And the reason I couldn't understand what it was, it was that it was divinity, power of divinity, which we cannot comprehend. So you need to find a goddess, a god, a spirit, whatever, that works for you, that you're already embedded with. If you're practicing as a witch and if you're training in magic, you will have already crossed paths with something that resonates with you. And just keep in mind that that higher power flows through everything, including yourself. And that's what you need to tap into via a vessel that you can externalize. That's why we have statues of deities, not because the statue is the deity, because it's an anchor and it's a vessel that can translate and that can step down power so that we can communicate with it. And it's not like you get a statue and get an altar and put the statue on an altar and a pot candle in front of it. That's playing at ritualization for the most part. That's not how it works, is utterance every day. Like there's an utterance I do every day, which is, you know, that's part of, if you want to call it religion, this utterance. And the deity does have a presence in the house and there is a statue that is an anchor for that presence. But I don't talk to the statue. I talk to the house and I utter to everything that's around me that she flows through. And I'll say, we've all struggled with lots of different things. And I'll say, I am at the end of what I can cope with. I've tried my best. Could you please help me through this? And also, I relinquish control. And that sentence, relinquish of control, can kick off all sorts of manner of things in people according to how they hear it and what it means to them. And it doesn't mean giving up who you are. It doesn't mean giving up your control over what you do with your life. What it means is that there's parts of your life, your fate, that no matter how much you try and control, you can't because it's beyond you. 
And those are the things that you say, I understand I can't control where this is going, not to that extent, and I can't do this alone. Therefore, I give up being completely a sealed, controlled unit, and I open my doors a bit and say, would you share this with me? Would you come along for the ride in this and help me? And the answer comes back in lots of different ways. I'm trying to find analogies for you to, to give you it in practical terms so you can actually see how it works. It is about, you know, understanding that there is stuff beyond that we can't control and that it is conscious and that you have to then bridge to that. And basically it's trust. Can you trust to allow that power to work with you? I remember, oh God, back years and years and years ago, I'd gone through a very contentious divorce. It was incredibly violent and difficult. And I'd fled with my kids, was hidden. Someone had given me sanctuary. I was hiding with my kids and, you know, I was trying to walk and I was still very young and I was trying to organize schools and, you know, how will I make an income and all these sort of things while also being physically recovering from something and, and being completely empty in my ability to cope. I, I just reached my very end. I remember laying on the bed and just saying to the universe, because I didn't at that point know who to talk to, I need help. I, I cannot, I'm trying my best to protect my kids, to do this an honourable way with, in the face of violence and dishonour. I can't do it anymore. I, I don't know what to do. I was just like, you know, I can't kill myself because I've got kids. I can't opt out. I have to do this, but I just can't do it. You know, I laid there for a while feeling really sorry for myself and having a good cry and something. And I started drifting into sleep. And this beautiful, and this is going to sound really new agey and gooey, but actually it was a really profound experience. This beautiful blue light, almost shaped like a woman, but not quite, just sort of started to build up at the side of the bed and put a hand on me and just said, I've got you. I've got you. You're not going to fall. Have courage. Wow. It's going to be okay. And so I thought I cried all the time. And she's like, oh, you know. <laughs> I had no idea what it was or who it was or what that was about, but it got me through. I, the following day, it's like, I'm not alone. Just, just knowing that I wasn't alone and that it'd been, the struggle had been recognized and that the cry had been answered was enough. Then I could put another foot in front of the other. And that happened to me subsequently two or three times in my life. And it was always when I really, really struggled to the end to try and do my best at something in the face of you know, horrific things is this hand would come and it's like, I've got you. you you're okay. Just, you're going to be okay. You're not going to fall. You're safe now. That's what you're looking for in this situation of going through the steps of addiction. In sort of psychological, theoretical terms, it is about sort of trust and relinquishing control I would take that, I'd evolve that a step forward and say, it's learning that you're not alone and that you're not always capable of doing everything in that struggle. And that there are times when you do need that hand to come on your shoulder and go, don't give in. You've got this. You're not alone. We're walking with you. You're going to come through this and you're going to blossom. And the way that you get that is you ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. And from a, a magical perspective, you can do it as I did it, which was just like, for fuck's sake, can somebody help me? Or you open the gates and go around the gates. And I've done that before in my youth as well, is, is you know, open the thresholds and, and just go around in, in to each direction because it's different powers and different contacts and just say, is there anyone here in this direction that can help? that can advise, you know, anything. What makes it work is your willingness to step up to the problem. 
And by doing the 12 step program, you know, Michelle has already stepped up to the problem. She's taken responsibility for it. She's stepped up. She knows where she wants to go and what she wants to achieve. She also knows it's a horrific struggle at times. And that with those sorts of struggles, you do need help. And you do need to understand that you can't do it all on your own, that you do need a connection, a divine connection to really become who you are. And this is very magical rather than mundane, is that you have a fate to become and you have a fate to open things out. And often before you get to that stage or during that stage, you go through some horrendous struggles because those struggles form you. They give you strength. They give you endurance. They give you wisdom. And they also give you compassion. If you've been through suffering, you recognize it in the eyes of other people and beings. And it gives you compassion, which is incredibly important. And so she's already there. She's, she's doing it. She's doing it. And now she needs to ask for that big sister. And what she needs to do is think about it in terms of how she wants to approach that. Does she want an inner contact big sister? Does she need a deity? What does she need? And not go in with a shopping list, but just say, when she's clear in her own head, this is what I need. And understanding that that higher power, what for whatever people want to call it, flows through all of those things and activates. That's the other thing is talking to the divine, however you perceive the divine, whether you perceive it as the very deepest eternal part of yourself or as a deity or as the divine universe or the consciousness of the planet. It's all the same thing. It really is. How do you define it to yourself? That's what's important. And then understanding that it flows, literally flows through everything. So what is right for you, as you say, I want a big sister, and you recognize that that big sister will be a vessel for the divine, that higher power to flow through, it will switch it on by your recognizing what it actually is. And that in itself, as you get older, it's like, you know, particularly over the last 10, 15 years, I've, I've done huge amounts of magical work, which have, you know, physically knocks the shit out of you because of the energy that it takes. And from an inner point of view, it knocks the shit out of you, while also going through menopause, which knocks the shit out of you. But having that connection, that divine connection, you know you're not alone. You know you've got somebody watching you back. You know that there's going to be limitation. When you need limitation, it will switch on because that's how divine power works. And it does. The amount of times I've been blocked from doing something because of the, you know, the levels of work I was doing and the menopause, my energies were so low that if I made another step forward on something, it would seriously damage me but I would be in a headspace that I just wouldn't be aware of that. And so I'd be blocked completely, sometimes physically, like can't get out the door because the door's locked and it, there's no key. Simple stuff like that. That's the fate kicking in and working with that power. But just knowing that and then finding out, oh God, yes, if I had done that or gone there, I would have been completely blasted. And at my age, you've got to be careful of things like that. So you are looked after. And so part of it is also learning to pay attention to recognize when it's kicking in and knowing, just that knowing makes so much of a difference. And it's not an imaginary knowing, it's real, it's very physical. So yeah, that's the way to go ahead with it. Josephine as well, uh, we have a listener question for you from JT Lopez, who is asking, Josephine, what are your thoughts on this grimoire revival period? With works such as The Elucidation of Necromancy, edited by Joseph H. Peterson, the newly released second edition of The True Grimoire, compiled and edited by Jake Stratton Kent, who we are certainly always uh, thinking of and, and wishing well, Magister of Fechorum by uh, Julio Cesar Ode, and Frater Ocker's upcoming book, Holy Heretics. We appear, JT says, to be living in a renaissance of Solomonic sublunar spirit focused magic. And JT says, there also appears to be a reawakening in the Western mind of the importance of African diaspora religions, such as Kimbanda, Obeya, and Palo, 
because of their close similarities to goetic magic. So JT is asking, what would you tell the budding magician eager to get involved in all of this? Thank you, JT says, and he adds, I hold much respect for you, Josephine, and your Quaria school. I worked with it for half a year, and when I stopped, I distinctly heard your disembodied voice scold me right as I woke up saying, quote, if you don't do the work, you'll never get anything done, unquote. <laughs> and it gave me a real jolt. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't escape me. <laughs> I'll get into your dreams. I know if you're not working, I will beat you. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. What would I tell the budding magician eager to get involved in all of this? Is like, if that style of magic draws you, then, you know, go where you're drawn to and go in with an intelligent mind. The people that you brought up, Peterson, Stratton, Kent, these sorts of people, these are intelligent people who, you know, really clearly look at these things. These fashions for grimoires go up and down. They come up around in circles. And the same of, of looking at, you know, other methods of magic and animism and things like that. Yeah, we get fashions, and that's very commercial. The fashions come and go. But there's also something deeper that happens underneath is where things start to come into the collective consciousness, like shaking a hand in the corner and saying, hey, have a look at this. And often it's because of what's going on around us, which worldwide rather than just individual, these things come up to the surface to be, to be looked at. What I would say to magicians in training is when you come across stuff like this and you find them of real interest, and it's not just a glamour interest, it's like, ooh, that looks sparkly. I think I'll buy that and put that on the shelf and, and things like that, or I'll play at this or play at that for a little while. That's just, it's out, that's playing, basically. But if you are drawn to a particular branch of magic like that, even if it's just, you know, if you still are doing the quarry training, it's irrelevant. You follow it, you look. And it might be that you need to look because you find you need to find one little thing, or it could be that it's opening up a pathway for you. The main thing is to learn to distinguish between the crappy glamour and the good stuff. And often it's not that obvious. The other thing to think about, with, especially with very old grimoires, when, you, when you're talking like 16th century grimoires and earlier, is you have to think about the culture that they were made in, which was uh, a Christian culture that was very superstitious and could be quite dangerous. And so you had to be very careful. But also there was a strong understanding of the need for hiding things magically so that people who were just playing wouldn't find them. They'd have something to play with on the surface. And then beneath it, when you dig, you'd find this really powerful magical pattern underneath it. The one I always use as a, as a good example of that is the Orbital. It has a surface layer of glamour. It has a second layer of, right, here's some rituals and sigils to work with which will teach you something and teach you how to do something and how not to do something. And then here's another layer that's underneath that that's actually quite powerful. And underneath that, there's another layer again that's just downright dangerous. It's so powerful. Um, but if you've managed to find it, then good luck with it. But there again, it's working within a mindset and belief system that we now would feel is not necessary or, or is, is counterproductive. And I'm really bad for this. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm a skeptic, always have been with a lot of stuff. So I tend to slam down things straight away and then I'll start to look closer. And if I realize that I'd spoken out of term, then I'll admit it and go, actually, no, this is, this is interesting. Go in with a skeptical mind with some of the grimoires and look at them. And if you see they're all glamoury and, you know, this angel has six hours, two colors, three friends, bloody, 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 blah, blah, blah. All of that is to keep the glamour busy. Look a bit closer. And if you look closer in and there's still no content there, and you'll know it, you'll feel it. 
then you've got a glamour grimoire, which, you know, they were very popular in the 16th and 17th century. They were a way of making money, for one thing. But then there were real ones, which were not there as recipe books or teaching. They were somebody's own journal, really, that ended up getting used and reproduced. And some were sent out into the world as as teaching, and, and the Arbitel particularly is very good for that, except 90% of people that read it miss it is they'll skip over or they won't even realise it's there. They'll have read it six or seven times and you'll say, well, what did you think about that? And they'll go, where? I didn't see that. And then you take them right to it and point at it and they'll go, wow, I never saw that. So you have to read each paragraph really carefully and think about it. And where you, this is an old technique, 15th, 16th century, where they'll say, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And it is like, this. It is like, you know, John of Patmos, or it's like that. And in the context of what the paragraph is about, you then go off and read the writing of that person that's to do with that, what that paragraph is about. And it's there that there's the fragment of part of the jigsaw. And then you go on a bit further and you find another part. It's a very difficult process. I mean, I went through that and, and did that with the Arbitel. And there was some looking back now at what I found. Some of it I was right on the nail, but some of it I can say, actually, I missed a point. It's that clever. It can take you down a dead end without you realising it. Very, very cleverly done. So, yeah, they can be fascinating. They can be really interesting. And if you wanted to get involved in that, why not? Go for it. You learn more by doing that. And doing that sometimes in a bad way where you get burned, you will learn a lot also. Magical training, you have your strict magical training, but you also have your discovery and you will learn a vast amount by sticking your face into pots and then learning why not to stick your face in that pot or by, you know, plowing through a lot of glamour and finding this absolute gem within it that can then open out work for you for the next 10 years. That's how you develop magically. So knock yourself out. Josephine as well, in terms of learning by doing, uh, that's probably best reflected in your Aquaria course. And to your point, we have another listener question for you about that from JT Lopez, who is asking and saying, Aquaria strives to teach the magician to stretch their minds to the magical thresholds but it doesn't really emphasize separating consciousness from the body, commonly called astral projection, journeying and entering the soul garden. And so JT is saying, in the eyes of the master Mason, Dion Fortune, Rudolf Steiner, uh, Emil Stenyar, and, and all who have inspired them, working with this modality is imperative to the destiny of the occultist after death. So JT is asking Josephine, why did you choose not to incorporate it? Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, the first thing is is that I think Lopez doesn't actually understand what astral projection is, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm not putting you down, JT. I'm just making a point. There is a huge amount of misunderstanding of what astral projection actually is, and what people think it is. And there's also a massive misunderstanding about visionary magic. Quaria is full of what real astral projection is about. It's one of the foundation stones of it. So let's take the word astral projection. Astral means inner. It's something that's, it's the not physical side of the worlds. It's the inner worlds. It's it used to be called astral because everyone thought that the inner world in the, was up, heaven, stars, okay? Hence astral. And projection means moving forward. That traces back to Blavatsky. And you have to take Blavatsky with a pinch of salt because some of her work was very interesting some of her work was very much locked in the Victorian mentality and some of it was just made up bullshit and misunderstanding, completely misunderstanding something that she'd been exposed to, which is not putting her down. 
in her time, she would never have been exposed to it before or since. So it's just this one exposure with no reference point in how to process it. And so you have to fill in the blanks. And she put that forward and it was she did a lot of change for people by doing that. But then people froze it in time and they didn't think about, I mean, she was looked at psychologically, but nobody really looked at her magically and took it apart to see where the gems were and where she tried to fill spaces because in her time, she, there was so little that she was exposed to that we are now exposed to, you know, times change. And so the, the concepts of magic has to flower and evolve with it. And this understanding of astral projection has sort of, you know, winnowed its way right down now over the last 50, 60 years to your soul or your spirit completely leaves your body and you stand in the corner looking at your body and that you have to train and train and train to squeeze your, your spirit out of your body. And then what do you do? That's a complete misunderstanding. And it's a not understanding how the spirit works, how the mind and imagination works, and how the vital force and energy works. This is from our understanding from doing, you know, and Quarrier didn't introduce this, by the way. This is this is long-standing work that went off on in the background, has gone on for hundreds of years. It's just that it, it never surfaced heavily in the popular books. And in the Victorian period, that's when a lot of popular books popped up and popular teachers and gurus and all this sort of thing. And everything had to be condensed right down and simplified into chewable bites, which is exactly the same today in, in you know the magical communities. When you're talking about astral projection, journeying, entering the soul garden, things like that, what you're talking about is where, for the most part, the majority of people think that their spirit is locked into their body, that their energy is locked into their body and that their skin is a barrier and that they go no further or they have a little bit of an aura around them and that's it. That's actually not correct. The body is a vessel. The spirit has the ability to spread out. It has no shape. It has no boundary other than the physical body, but it can stretch beyond that and it can spread right out and it can experience, it can bump up against other spirits, other energies. Your vital force can bump up against somebody else's vital force or the vital force of a tree or a rock. The mind is the bridge of communication and within the mind is the imagination which provides the vocabulary. Now, one of the problems that happened in magic in the early 20th century is that psychology became the big thing. And in itself, that's good. Psychology does a lot of very good stuff. When it crosses into magic, it's very limited in its use. But because it was the big thing of the time, it was woven into magic very heavily. And so everything became about you and yourself and your processing and your subconscious and all of this, which cut dead this understanding that the mind and the imagination is a bridge between the body and the spirit that can expand. And it's a bridge between the mind, the body, the spirit, and everything else that's out there that has its own inner expression or astral expression for, if you want to use 19th century language. So visionary work, which is, this is gets complicated. Let me, let me separate this out a bit. From the 1960s onwards, for a little bit before that as well, is two forms of visionary work developed. One is pure visionary work. The other is journeying. And there's various different names for it. And the journeying is where there's a path already set there is a construct of a place which has been constructed specifically for that journey, like a palace or whatever, where people can operate in. Visionary work is different in that although when you're training, you train with some basic set paths and a construct, 
but that is just a bridge through that into opening out to what's actually there. So it goes from being a psychological path working into your spirit is actually out there in that place while also in connected to your body, otherwise you wouldn't live. And it's interacting with something. And the only way that your conscious mind can work with that and the only way your spirit can verbalize that is through the imagination. So the imagination becomes a processing unit for visuals and communication. So it's like a TV set. You don't make the things up. It's what the spirit sees and experiences and then sends back to you. Well, it's not even sending back to you because you're in both places at once. This is the other thing people don't get their heads around. You can be sat physically in one place and you can stretch your spirit out to a completely different place and be conscious about it and operate within that in a controlled way. Some people call that remote viewing. That's when it's in this world, in this physical world, in this time. So you're in the same time slot. You're in the same world. You're in the same planet. You can stretch and you can look and then you can come back. And these are all techniques. And in Quarrier, they're trained in these techniques from day one. And it is one of the major cornerstones in all magic, no matter where. And when you start looking back, once you've done a lot of visionary work and you start looking at writings from Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, places like that, you can start to spot where they're talking about visionary magic. They just use different vocabulary, but you, you can see by what they're talking about. And that's what they're doing. It's something that Paracelsus talks about. This is not a new thing. The thing it isn't is psychology, and it's not your own projection of what you want to see. And that is the very difficult one for people to make that jump. So there's a lot of training that has to go in to separate that out. And as you say, it is imperative for the occultist to be able to do this. And it's not just imperative to the destiny of the occultist after death. It's imperative for your fate and destiny and your magical work and your life in life as well. And it carries on in death. For example, we uh, looked at the Book of Gates, which now everyone seems to be looking at and doing things around. When Michael and I were working on it, it, it was unheard of. No one had ever come across it because it was only ever used very briefly for a couple of hundred years in Egypt. It's an incredibly profound funerary text, but in it, it talks about workers in the underworld, in the Duat, working with the deity, with the solar deity, and working with the dead while they're living. So people working in vision. And it, in fact, for years and years, I mean, I, when I was sort of in my 20s and 30s, a, a lot of my magical work for development was working in the underworld. You always go down first before you go up and you learn how to work in the underworld. You learn how to work with death and destruction before you let loose on anything else. So I was doing a lot of that sort of work. At the same time, I was of the opinion that Egypt was a pile of crack, that there was no magic there at all because I was an opinionated silicone. And that carried on right up until, oh God, maybe, I don't know, 12, 14 years ago. And so I suddenly realized, actually, there is a lot of magic there. It's just, it's, they don't have magical books. Their religion was, which is where magic was in the ancient world. Their religion was all about death. And I'd never thought to look at the funeral texts. But looking at the funeral tax first with the Book of the Dead, and I started to say, hang on a minute, that's these transformation spells, things like that. This is magic. This is actually really powerful magic. Then you look at the Book of Gates and you see this immense amount of magic in there. Very clever. And it's working. You have the living people working alongside the dead as service and as also of their training. So, you know, it's you don't separate out your destiny into life and death. They're the same thing. And you work in both. In death, you work in life. In life, you work in death as a magician. 
So that visionary work is what enables that to happen because that's how it works. If you don't do visionary magic, you're not going to be able to access that sort of thing because ritual magic and all the exteriorized form of magic, it's a boundary. It's an externalization which is needed for the inner work, but without the inner work, there's nothing to fuel it. There's nothing to move around within it. Just as just visionary work is just as unhealthy because it needs the physical work, the ritual work, the, you know, contacted writings, you know, working with sigils, working with nature, with physical things, grounds it and also gives it a gateway to flow through. So they're of each other. You cannot have a complete magical training without both the physical and the inner. So, yeah, you're not correct. We did choose to incorporate it. It is actually the foundation of Quarrier, the whole thing. If you actually look, you don't look for the words astral projection. You look at the work itself. If you've done astral projection properly, you'll recognize the work. What a lot of people think of as astral projection, like I said earlier, is this suddenly you're shoot, you've shut out your body and you're stood looking at your body. You're not out of your body as in you haven't left it. You have stretched because there's, there's no boundary for the spirit. And it's done it in an uncontrolled, projected way, which is actually really unhealthy for you. And it causes a panic in the body. So it sucks it straight back in again. So it's often very difficult to control in act what people think of as the astral projection of standing or floating on the ceiling, looking down, that sort of thing. Yes, that happens. That is a part of visionary stuff. But it's an unhealthy in that it's not as safe. It leaves you wide open for all sorts of problems. And it also puts a horrendous strain on the body. So the older you get, the more dangerous it becomes. Whereas working in a more controlled way and understanding the stretching and that being in two places at once is perfectly normal. You don't have to, you know, have the spirit just over there and it's left the body. When you do that, if your spirit completely leaves your body, your body dies. It just, it just doesn't work like that. So it is stretched. I mean, maybe that's not the right word. The actual reality is you're in two or even three different places at once. So, yes, it is in the course. Yes, it is imperative. And yes, you missed that one. Again, I, I know myself and I'm sure the listeners as well, Josephine, really appreciate that that context. And when it comes to the Quaria course, we have another listener question for you from Alex S. who is saying, Hi, Josephine. I absolutely love your work, and I am thankful for all the good you spread. As a person who tried Quaria but was told that I could not continue because of mental health conditions, schizophrenia, in general, what magical direction would you suggest an individual take? It depends on the individual themselves. I mean, it really sucks for some people. There are certain mental health conditions that really you know, quarrier would become very dangerous for them. And the same with some physical health conditions as well. You know, if, if somebody's got an uncontrolled cancer, for example, things, things like that, you know, there's, there's not many mental or physical health conditions that would mean it's dangerous for you, but there are some. And schizophrenia is, is one of them. And Alex, I, I just feel so bad for you with that because that's a really difficult one to work with. Really, in terms of magical direction, if you're really pulled into magic and you really want to do it, then think in terms of exteriorization. Because with the mind with schizophrenia, in a way you're lucky and in another way it it's really sucks. But from a, working with a, a lot of stuff that's visionary can trigger the condition to worsen, which is there's just no way around that. And I've tried with various people over the years and it just really just doesn't, it doesn't come out well at the end. But with that condition, also your, your boundaries in the mind are a lot looser and I'm trying to find the right word for it, much more 
a bit like candy floss. You can move it around a lot more. It's not rigid. And so in a way, you don't actually need to do the visionary work because you've got that fluidity of the mind. You can turn it to your own advantage. And the way to do that is when you're in a good space, is take notes, keep a journal of any magical stuff. And then when you start to feel things are going south a bit, is that you make sure you pull back from anything that is using the mind and just keep the body working in magic. So ritualization, ritual work is very grounding for the mind. Contacted writing. It's a really interesting one with schizophrenia, some of the best contacted writers. Magical writing is not just about writing stuff down for other people to know. You can actually write magic where people do a vision. You can do it in writing instead. Like when I work in vision, I know where I want to go, as in I know what power I want to work with and what that the boundaries of that power are. And the boundary can present as a building or a place. And often that that image has been built up over hundreds and hundreds of years by different magicians working with it. So it becomes really stable. So I, I know I'm going there and I'm, I, within that place, I can do what I need to do. And I come back out again. And that's all working in the mind. Now, I don't know what's going to happen when I get there. And I might have to go through that into somewhere else that I don't at that point know. So it's not pre-planned and it just goes where it needs to go. I don't want just wander around aimlessly. I have a very specific reason for where I'm going and what I'm doing. But at the same time, there's a lot of things then where, because it's a real interaction. It's like, you know, you go into town shopping and there might be an accident in front of you. So you all have to get off the road. You didn't see that coming. That's not planned. That's how visionary work, when it switches into real visionary contact and not just your own mind. Now, for a schizophrenic, you can do that through writing, as in, you know, you, you can start off with, for example, there's a visionary construct called the inner library, which a lot of different magical systems work with, and they have done for many, many years. It's really stable. And you go there to learn and to make contacts and, and ask questions. So you'd start writing. I am walking down the road. As I get to the end of the road, the road starts to fall away and I notice that trees are forming. And what you're doing is you're writing what you're seeing. And, you know, the trees have fallen away. Oh, and, and now it, the trees are turning into columns and suddenly these, these books are appearing. And as the books are appearing, there's a person comes out from behind of them. I'm going to ask him a question, but you're doing it in writing. That gives it an anchor straight away. It physically externalizes it. So you can work like that. You can do the same with painting. The other thing is, is not just going to somewhere like the inner library and wanting to do things in vision is if you have an intent to bring something through, an intent to trigger something magically, you do the ritual around it and you, instead of doing the vision, you write and you will know what to write. You will know if you've done the ritual and you've started the process, what will come out could be anything from the writing of a vision or the writing of instructions for powers to follow. Or it could be who is going to carry that power, who is going to work with it, what are they going to do with it. That's an externalization of magic. It's not easy and it's not always successful. It takes time to learn. But things that externalize, paintings, writing, physical movement, making things, if you're wanting an actual group Look for magical work that works very closely physically with nature, not, not in vision. Look for groups that work in high ritual, high ceremony, things like that. Because for you, it will trigger more. As a schizophrenic, it will trigger more than it will trigger for the ordinary person. So in a way, while it's a disability, it's also a gift. And you have to learn how to use it. 
And you've also to learn how to distinguish when it's tripping from gift to disability. And you will only realize that when it's starting to bridge, once it's fully bridged, then you won't be in a position to realize it. So that, that's why journaling is so important. But yeah, no, I really feel with you for that one because it's it's like your eyes don't work for an artist. It's like there's a part of you that just will not function in the way that everybody else functions, but it does function in other ways that can work just as well. So experiment, do discoveries. And if you find things that work, journal it so that, you know, as you gain more experience, some younger person that's coming up that has the same condition, you can turn around to them and you can advise them because that's where learning will come from, is you experiencing, taking note, journaling, recognizing when the problem is tipping over and backing off the magic. That's the important one. Even though the, the schizophrenia might want to push you more into the magic, you back it up if you can. And dance it out. Dance is also a really good one for schizophrenia. Dance it out. Dance the power out of you. And write, journal, write, write the magic. And then as other people come along, you're in a position to turn around and help them and say, actually, you don't need to go through all that shit because I did it. Here you are. Go through your own shit and you'll learn even more. And then you can pass that on to the next one so that in three or four generations, magicians who have schizophrenia will have a good working system to work with because you triggered the beginnings of the formation of that. Finding what works for you, how to approach things safely, how to approach things in, in a pattern that is structured around your individual situation. That's, that is so lovely. Josephine as well. Uh, we do have a few more listener questions for you on your just amazing deck and paintings and the book about the deck. And we have a listener question for you from a Trey Henry and N. And this is about process. And so Trey and, and N are asking, can you share a bit about, Josephine, your process with the new deck art? How did you come to each subject or it to you? How did you decide what to include and what to leave out? Did you work both in vision and at the canvas at the same time? Anything you can share about the magic and the art and the art and the magic would be rad. In terms of the vision and working on the canvas, yeah, yes and no. When you do a lot of visionary work over a long time, they, they gets to a point where you can work in vision and be doing something at the same time. It's not the same as a, a very controlled vision where you're very involved in it and very aware of what's going on. It's almost like you put on a pair of glasses that allow you to see and hear and feel more. So you're sort of tuned into a visionary state of mind, for want of a better word, while painting, which is one of the reasons why I'd spend hours working on a painting instead of being more disciplined with it. I'd just keep going until that day I said, right, you're done. And I, I couldn't explain to you how I do that because I just do. I do it and I wouldn't be able to tell you how to do it because... I don't know the mechanism. It just built up over the over the two years that I was doing the paintings. Coming to each subject, that's the mapping process. You know, deciding what to include and what to leave out. As I said before, you start with a mapping process, which is a complicated magical process in itself, which I'm also toying with the idea in, in once I finish the deck book of maybe going into that in depth for people who want to do it for themselves and how to do very focused decks, like an exorcist deck, things like that. It's a long process. And, you know, a podcast like this is, we wouldn't have the time really to cover all of that. But you start out with the mapping and the structure, and then they start to conceive of themselves and then become aware of each other because you're producing beings, basically. They access and they mediate a certain energy. And so they start talking to each other. And yeah, I ended up talking to them and, and telling them off and this sort of thing. And they decide what needs to be in and out. And we talked about this with the overlaying uh, and the underpainting is that they basically took over what went in, what didn't go in, how, how they were perceived, how they weren't perceived, how they would be finished, 
what the locking in process would be. That actually came from the beings that flow through the deck and the powers that flow through it. But I had to start with that with a magical pattern first, because otherwise you're just flailing around with no focus whatsoever. So, yeah, no, there's, I will write about that, I think, in the future, because I think it'd be useful for people. We do have another uh, listener question for you, Josephine, from Trey Henry, who is asking, uh, one of the pieces from the new deck looks to be documenting the effed up magical path with all its twists, turns, and dead ends. Hit us with your sagely advice, Trey says. How do we optimize, Josephine, the journey? Can it be optimized at all? Is this even the right question? That painting ended up being an underpainting in the end up. It turned out it wasn't part of the deck. It needed to be a layer for another painting. So it's under one of the paintings. But yeah, it was this very twisty path with lots of dead ends and stuff like that, because that's how magic is. And if you try to optimize the, the magical path, you know, a magical path is not software. It's not a business career. It literally is twists and turns and dead ends because every single little part of that path teaches you, matures you, strengthens you, slaps you around, holds a mirror up to you. You know, you can't optimize something like this. All you can do is learn more about yourself and be more truthful with yourself because then you tend to end up in less and less dead ends and less twists and turns. All of those complexities at the, at the early stages of working a magical pathway are lessons. You think you're getting the lessons from reading something and doing exercises. Now, the lessons are coming from the experiences and then also coming from the stupid acts and the running into brick walls and going down a rabbit hole and getting stuck, climbing a tree and then falling out of it. All of those sorts of things. That is your magical path. People just don't get this. You know, it's not the robes, it's not the tools, it's not the glamour, it's not the title, the sash, the how many rituals you know, all of that, the wisdom and sagely stuff. It's all bollocks. It's not about that at all. It's like life. It's messy. It's rough at times. You get bumps and scrapes. You get overweight. You have to lose weight. It's the same energetically. You know, all of that. It really isn't something that you can optimize. The only thing you can do to optimize is use your common sense. Don't be selfish and stupid. Keep looking at yourself and looking at your motives for doing so and be brutally honest with yourself because then you start to grow. You don't become all wise and sagely. You become battered and bruised and strong. And the wisdom comes from, you know, because you did it yourself and you burnt that finger. So you do know. This idea of the wise magician at the end of their life is a long haired, you know, sat in lotus position on a mountain who every time they open their mouth, great profound things come out is just bollocks. We also have another listener question for you, Josephine, from Trey Henry about Quaria. And Trey is asking, with Quaria in the hands of so many people spread all over the world, Josephine, is there anything you regret about Quaria's unfolding or anything you would go back in time and change? Not really. The only thing I'd go back and change is that I was dumb enough when I was doing the early modules to put internet links into the lessons. I really ah. didn't grasp at that point because I'm, I'm not overly tech aware that websites come and go, that things are taken down and all, all that sort of carry on. So that was really stupid thing to do. But apart from that, no, it's like something like this. You do it, you finish it, it goes out into the world and then you start to see where its weak spots are and, you know, well, I could have done that differently, but that's true of everything. That's what artists, writers, thinkers, scientists, all it means you've grown. You can start to see the, the weak bits, the you know messy bits, things like that. You don't want to go back and change those because they're part of the process. And it also shows people that these things are a process of development, that you, again, back to what Trey was asking, you don't end up as 
the finished piece as an adept. You're a work in progress all the time. So you're constantly evolving, which means your work is constantly evolving. And you should be able to look back at your work and go, oh, God, did I really say that? Or, yeah, that's not the best way to do it. But it's important not to change that, A, because it's unhealthy to keep going back and re-editing something. You know, it's really not a good idea to do it magically for a start off. But also it is very important, I think, for people out in the world when they're reading a book or doing a course or something like that or, or following an artist to see the early processes, to see the development, to see the mistakes, to see the weaknesses, because then they realise that these aren't super duper superhuman beings up on a pedestal somewhere. They're normal people like you and me. And they go through a process and you can see that developmental process, which means you can do it too. I know yourself and Jake Stratton Kent says, you know, you have to be willing to get your fingers burned. You have to be willing to do it. And to be red faced, you know, to write something. And then 15 years later, someone turned around and goes, did you actually say that? Did you really mean that? And it's like, well, yeah, at the time I did, but, you know, I've grown a bit since then and realized that that was actually full of shit. And that was an opinion that wasn't valid and things like that. It's important that people can see change and growth and understand it. Josephine, as well, we have a listener question for you from Ella Ho, who is asking and saying, I have so much respect for Josephine and her work. Let's just say I'm incredibly excited for this conversation and to learn about her upcoming projects. And Ella is asking, Josephine, you have written that women often first become aware of magic through their intuition. Why do you think that is? I don't think it's for any super magical duper reason. I think it's more to do with... Well, at least for my generation, I mean, this, the, I might have to, this might be one of the things that I'd made a comment on in the past that I might have to reevaluate. When I was a kid, back when the dinosaurs were roaming, if you were a girl, and especially in the community I grew up in, you weren't expected to come to much other than get married and have kids and work to bring in money. And so there wasn't as much focus and emphasis on the girls. Whereas the boys always had to be super responsible and, you know, turning around to a seven-year-old boy and saying, well, I'm going away. You know, this is a dad speaking. I'm going away for a month on business. And so you're the man of the house until I come back of putting all of that responsibility on a a seven-year-old. And this was just normal. The reason I think it's like that or part of it is culture, is that, you know, the girls were allowed to be, you know, more of dreamers laying in the fields, looking at the stars and wandering through the forest and, you know, living in a fantasy land and all that sort of thing as kids, which allows your intuitions and imagination to open up, both of which are very important in magic. Whereas boys had to be very much in here, be present in the world. You've got responsibilities, you've got to do your exams, you've, you've got to be tough, you've got to be manly and all this sort of shite. And it shuts them down. And I think that's one of one of the issues. The other is, and they tend to come to it more through their intuition first than finding a magical book, is hormones. And again, this is just, I'm only speaking from my own experience and, and the women around me. I might be completely off base with this, but from, from what I'd seen and what I'd experienced is the, the hormonal flows because you know whereas men are reasonably level with their hormone system apart from the peaks in the teens and and 20s is that women are having to peak and trough every month and you know the the hormone cocktail that is constantly shifting and changing does affect your emotions for one thing and it affects your immune system it affects your sleep and your dreams so it's not a stretch to think it's also going to affect your inner abilities and your intuition. And for me, it certainly did. I came into my magical stability after I had a hysterectomy. It was like, thank God for that. And it, this stability, I would started to remember the feeling of that before I'd had my first period. I used to be, I had a real sort of tuned feel to me, which just went when I hit puberty. 
And having my uterus taken out, I uh, within a year, I got that same tuned feeling back and it was wonderful. And women have to go through this cocktail of hell every month and then through pregnancy and then, you know, the breastfeeding and everything that goes with that is going to affect your intuition. And I think that women tend to be more aware of that from being children. But there again, that might be changing because the world has changed a lot since then, you know, contraceptives, hormone treatments, you know, women choosing not to have children, all of that sort of thing. And having money and status, which is important, you know, women are no longer, well, hopefully not in our society anyway, brought up that they're just there to breed. Therefore, you don't need to think your pretty head about anything else. So I don't know if that changes it. I really don't know. What I think would be very interesting in terms of finding out if it is partially a hormonal thing is where people who are in a male body who are transitioning into a female body and do hormone treatment and surgery, how it works for them just from a purely biological perspective, if they're on a hormone treatment, once it's settled down and their system's got used to it, how does it affect their intuitions, their dreams, their magic? And that's something that maybe people in that community will start to talk about once they've got magic underneath them and they've gone through these transitioning processes and gone out into the world, and they're working magically as who they are as individuals, what does the actual hormonal thing, treatment, what does it do to their intuitions and their magic? I think that these are very important questions for that community to ask and for the magical community to ask so that we can understand better. Definitely. And I think, Josephine, that fits into Ella's next question, which is, do you, Josephine, have any thoughts on whether the act of giving birth may have magical implications, such as, I can't think of a better way to phrase it, switching on or off natural abilities. Well, if you're talking about the actual act of giving birth, I think you're that busy, well, I was anyway, that busy screaming and thrashing around that I couldn't have thought of anything, let alone natural abilities. In terms of after giving birth and stopping screaming and flailing around, for me, it was a weird one. The actual magic magic faded off into the background, which you'd expect because it's not safe around a baby. But my actual intuition got really strong. It was like I was constantly doing inner risk assessment and not just consciously. It was like my whole being was on threat assessment all the time. So I was picking up everything, which I found really difficult because I was only in my early 20s trying to switch that off. Well, you can't, but I eventually learned to dump it down a little bit, but it actually turned out to be a lifesaver because my first daughter had a lot of problems in, you know, first seven years of um, fits that would go on for a long time and be quite dangerous. And I got to a point of intuition where I could feel it coming. So I'd know um, and could take action. And a lot of that sort of thing, it, it really became strong, but strong in a way of just risk assessment. Everything else just went out the window. Now, that might be individual for me. I don't know. I, I really don't know. So I think it would cause some change at least. And it could switch on and it can switch off. You've just got to find out for yourself. Ella also has a question for you, Josephine, saying, some prominent occultists talk about making offerings to the land beings, fae, spirits that share the land you live on. Do you have any opinions on that practice? Well, yeah, it's one of the foundation practices in Quaria is that you make friends with the beings that are around you. And especially on the land, the fairy beings, the ancestors, the land spirits, all of that. And it's one of the first things that a quarry student has to do is they have to first learn to give and take and let go of things and then to leave appropriate gifts as like a calling card and good manners. It's always been important. It's, it's not a new thing. If you want to work in a community of all these different types of beings, then you have to be nice. 
And if you've moved on to a patch of land, other beings already live there and have lived there for a very long time before you got there. Even if there's been a house there for a hundred years, when you go in, you always treat it as though this is the first time that someone has been here. And the first thing I'm going to do before I do anything is I'm going to give an offering to the land and ask permission, not assume you have it, to live here. And if there's a problem with that, how can we modify it that works for all of us? People give gifts like that in order to get something back, which is a mistake. It has to be given freely and not expect anything back. That's really important because the energy is different. Giving in order to receive is not giving, it's taking. Giving because it's the right thing to do is giving. And when you go onto the land, you give. And you also not just give as offerings, you share what you have. So, and you look for what they need. Like for here, we went through, along with a lot of Europe, a period of a few weeks of extremely hot weather, which we're not geared up for here. And the land's not geared up for. This is where I live on Dartmoor. It's usually windy, wet, cold. And the difference between summer and winter is that summer is a little less cold, but just as windy and wet. And the winter is fucking cold and windy and wet and snowy. So the houses are not geared up for it. Our clothes are not geared up for it. And the land and the plants are not geared up for it, for this level of heat. And instead of going out and giving an offering because you want something back or because you want to stay in the good graces, you look around and you think, right, well, a lot of the plants seem to be doing okay. They're hanging in there. The birds are really hungry because they can't find any insects. So we got mealyworms, put mealyworms out and seeds for the birds. There were some trees. We have some trees that grow here that just don't do hot weather and don't do drought. They just can't cope with it. And these are both magical trees. So we had to give them water, keep giving them water. And then as it's coming to, they're starting to leaf drop a lot earlier. It's giving them maple syrup in the water because it gives them sugar to help them get through the winter. It's carbohydrate that helps them get through the winter in their roots. We did a lot of clearing so that air could flow better. And in terms of gifts, I was giving honeycomb to the base of a tree, to we have a standing stone in the garden, to the standing stone. That will be eaten by the wasps that have been kicked out and things like that. That's irrelevant. It's for the whole garden, for all the beings, including the wasps. It's for the wind. It's for the rain. It's for everything. And if you, you do that, you become a part of a little community of trees, rocks, fairy spirits, land beings, wind spirits, everything. And you look after each other in all these different ways. And your job in that is to make sure everyone's got food and water that they need. If they don't need it, you leave them alone. But if you can see them struggling, then you go out and you water them. If it's coming up to autumn and they're going to need carbohydrate and there's not being enough water for them to produce it from their photosynthesis, then you have to put it into the water. Maple syrup, because it comes from trees, is the best way to do it. Yeah, so it's not like formal gift giving, if you see what I mean. It's not ritualized. It's not in a temple or temple offerings or anything like that. It's where temple offerings idea came from. And this is very Irish. It's a very Irish, old fashioned Irish way of doing it is, you know, you bake a cake, first slice goes out for the fairies. You just make sure that it's not a chocolate cake because chocolate is quite dangerous for a lot of animals. So you make sure it's something that if an animal comes along and eats it, it's fine. And the minute you put that offering down, what happens to it is none of your business. So you don't try and stop animals or anything else getting it because they're all part of the spirit of the garden. So yeah, give away. We also have another listener question for you from Ella Josephine. And Ella's asking, if someone Josephine is interested in better understanding Ma'at and the scale, uh, how would you recommend that they begin to understand Ma'at? Understanding Ma'at intellectually is, is a very difficult way to do it. 
in terms of, you know, reading a book and things like that, because Mart is such a fluid concept that you take so much of your own culture and baggage with you when you look at it so that you, you know, you can get 10 people reading a book on Mart and they'll all come away with completely different things, which can be a good and bad thing. Uh, it's good if they all get together and debate it, but it's not even scratching the surface. Really, if you want to understand Mart magically as opposed to intellectually, then you practice it. And Mart is about being a fulcrum. It's about balance. It's also truth. It's necessity. It's justice. And the way that you learn about that is by living it, which is really hard. And it's a long process. But the moment you start it with intent, everything with magic, it's always the intent will trigger something bigger than just doing it itself. So you start with first looking at yourself and seeing where your imbalance, real imbalances are. Are they physical? Uh, where your truth is? Where's your boundary of where you withhold the truth or, or tell on truth? And also understanding that everyone does that. Everyone is the same. And that sometimes truth can be vicious and destructive. So you start to see that truth is not easy, it's complex and it's messy. So you spend a lot of time just, just thinking about yourself and thinking about, yeah, well, where, where's my boundaries with that? Where, you know, and where's my stupidity with that? And we all have them. And, you know, where's my physical imbalances? And where's my imbalances in how I treat other people? Is it sometimes necessary to be obnoxious and aggressive? Because sometimes it is necessary. But is there times when it's you like that and it's not necessary? And that's when you say to yourself, you know what? I was a jerk. I behave like a jerk. And we all do. The difference is, is can you recognize it? That's the first step in that, is that recognizing it. And then you start very slowly to try and intentionally bring about a change one step at a time. That's part of the process. The next process is also physical balance, which sounds completely weird if you're talking about magic, is your own state of physical balance, like literally, can you balance on one leg, actually has a lot of impact on your magic because it flows through your body. Your body, your spirit, your mind, they're all intertwined and you can't separate them out. If you train one part of that imbalance, the other parts start to learn it too. So you teach all across. So you teach your imagination balance, you teach your mind balance, your words, your body, as in, you know, do you need to sort your diet out? Things like that. Are you living in as much balance and mart as you can? Or is there a lot of things that need to be changed and you can't change everything all at once? You start looking at these little bits but a really good one. And I used to teach my ballet students this because in ballet, obviously, you've got to be able to balance on one leg. And one of the things I would teach them is there's, there's a particular movement in ballet and you would have them on one leg with their extended leg to the back and they would have to then rise onto what's called demi point. So it's not right up onto the top point. It's rising the heel off the floor to the ball of the foot. It's actually a lot harder than it sounds. And keeping the balance with that is very difficult unless you've got absolute perfect natural balance, which some people do, but most don't. So they'd struggle with it. So they'd be an arabesque and they'd be flopping around all over the place and they'd work really hard to try and muscle it into position. I'd say, no, 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 no. Your muscles are fine. Your mind is not balancing with you. So I would teach them, okay, there's a hand that comes down out the ceiling. As soon as you get up into arabesque and you're on demi point, a hand comes down from the ceiling and gets you by the hair at the top of, right at the top of your head, where the top part is. And it very gently pulls you into position and it holds you there so that you can balance. And by God, they could all stand there because they'd brought the active balance through the mind and into the body and then put the two together. And that's how it works. And Mart is the same. That's Mart in a physical action. Mart is also a society rule. So 
you know, you can start looking at society and, and where the imbalances and where the mind, the body, the actions and the words can come together for you personally to operate within that nation in a balanced way. Because as a magician, when you do that with intent, it starts to affect the imbalance that's around you. This, again, is a whole separate podcast on its own, is balance in a pure state is very fleeting and brief. It's like literally seconds. Mart is about working towards that and not quite achieving it, but trying. And it's about constant counterbalancing. So you think of scales that are moving around and they're constantly trying to counterbalance with different weights. And that's the action of Mart. Mart isn't the static balance. It's the process that helps keep something close to balance. So it's about counterweights. It's about joining two opposing sides, inner and outer, physical mind, things like that, bringing them together. It's looking at how that works in your everyday life, of how do you counterbalance stuff? How do you bring in truth into something that's productive? So you want to understand, Mark, you have to bring it through yourself. You have to work on it uh, in lots and lots of different ways until you find one that turns on the, the lights for you rather than trying to read books. So, Josephine, we also have a few anonymous listener questions for you as well. Uh, The first question from anonymous is, Josephine, there are books on shamanism that talk about the shamanic journeying in order to meet your power animal. Is shamanic journeying the same as going into vision, anonymous is asking, or is it something different? And is there a quaria equivalent to power animals? Shamanic journeying is a form of visionary work. It just has less control and it's more natural reaction to stuff. You don't have any, basically any control over what's happening to an extent. But yeah, it's it's very, very similar. In terms of power animals, that you have to take apart a bit because, you know, the, the shamanism that's out there in books is a very commercial, heavily changed form of tribal magic. The actual word shamanism comes from a very specific area, which is the name for their particular tribal magic. And tribal magic works with animals. But this idea of you go on, you bang a drum and you go into vision and you get your power animal that then becomes your best buddy and does everything for you is a complete construct. It it really doesn't work like that. There are animals, it's spirits of animals and physical animals that will work with you. And... That's in the course, and it's also in the deck as well. But you don't get them by paying a lesson, going to a workshop, buying a book, blah de blah and then choosing what power animal you want and going to get it or, or doing a particular thing just to get a power animal. They find you when you're at a stage where you need one and where you're working and you're helping the nature, the animal kingdom. And so that, in, like in Korea, the whole basis of magic is communication and cooperation with different beings, including physical animals, birds, insects, and inner animals, birds, insects. And the, you know, if you want to go find a power animal, the first thing that's going to happen is either it's all going to be in your own fantasy and play itself out in your own psychology. Or the inner animal kingdom is going, well, what did you do for us? Where were you when we needed you? What do you do? You have to give first. What do you do? Do you help animals, creatures in everyday life? What is your attitude towards nature? And that starts up a conversation. So, like, for example, you know, Last night, I was sat out having a coffee and a cigarette out on the back step, and it opens out into a small part of the garden around the back, which is very, not overgrown, it's worked with, but it's very natural. It's rewilded. There was a snail coming along, but where it was going to, it couldn't see. Where it was going to, it would then go over something that would damage it, and there was no way around it. 
So what I did was very gently pick the snail up and at first they grip. So I just held and then just gently let it release. And then I put it among the greenery where it was nice and damp so that it could move around easily and it had food. Just a simple everyday thing, stuff like that. You keep an eye out on everything that's around you. We make sure the badgers can come in and out and the hedgehogs can come in and out, things like that. And that starts to build up a respect within you towards nature and within nature for you. And through your magical process, Quarry is a weird mix in that, you know, there's some structure in it that's very temple based and there's some that's very animist. There's a lot of, it quote, shamanic animist work in there. Through doing that work, it opens up things, it puts signals out, your willingness to not squish things because you don't like them, but to step around them or to work with them. And when something turns up at your door, you help it. You put out signals so animals do start to find you. You know, the amount of times I've had a dog come to my door that's been hit by a car and it's somehow known to get to me so I can work with it and then get it to a vet. When I lived out in the wilderness, you know, this huge cat that was in a shocking state and I didn't think he'd make it. I worked with him homeopathically, cranially, herbs, food, cleaning, the whole thing, got him very comfortable. And he decided to stay. You know, you you don't trap an animal and he come and go as he pleases, but he chose to stay and worked as a guardian with me. And my whole life's been like that with animals, and birds and insects, spiders. I work a lot with the spiders in the house. And that's how you work with animals. Now, there's also a thread in magic and it's not purposely triggered. It's when you get to a certain stage of development where you're not a toddler anymore, you're not, the world doesn't revolve around you and you've understood that and you've started to become a team player If your fate necessitates it, an animal, a spirit animal will turn up or a bird. And it's not like it's there all the time, but in times of danger or stress and things like that, when it's necessary, it will, you'll feel it the side of your leg, it'll turn up and it's nudging you in certain directions, things like that. This is the problem these days with print-on-demand publishing, while it it allows some amazing work out there, it also allows a lot of trash out there as well that's there simply to make money or to boost the ego of someone. And there's also a lot of taking of tribal and cultural magic and flipping it into a New Age presentation and then selling it. And it's such a fragment. It becomes such a waste of time. It's also insulting to the tribal community that it comes from. That you'll find an interesting way sometimes to learn about this, besides doing it, is to look in stories, very old stories and mythologies, because that's how wisdom and knowledge used to be passed on, especially in cultures where there wasn't the written word. Irish culture, you know, there was the written word, but stories and epic poems, same with the Nordic countries. This is how knowledge and wisdom was passed on. And you can learn a lot looking at these. And especially when something keeps happening and you're not sure about it and you read it, oh, that's what's going on. Okay, this is what it wants. This is why it keeps presenting. Again, you have to give first. You have to step into the community and earn the right to be there by your actions and what you do. And that in turn then triggers you within that community. So you do get spirits, creatures, things like that start to flow back and forth, both physical as well as spirit. There was a rook we called Richard because he had a badly broken leg, Richard Crookshanks. He turned up and he was in a shocking state. He'd obviously been badly injured and couldn't eat properly. And so, and when a bird starts showing signs of illness or damage, then often it's too late. But we fed him, we watered him every day. He'd come three, four times a day. We'd make sure he had food, he had water, and he'd come and ask. And until he got stronger and stronger and stronger, and then he left. And that's the other thing is, let them go. Just let them go when they want to go. But what I found since then, we still see him flying around with his leg, is when there's bad storms coming in, he gets really loud outside the house. He's telling us, you know, big storm coming in. 
and key yourself down. That's how you work with animals and, and spirits. And you will find that sometimes a living animal will also work as a spirit animal. It will come into your dreams. It will come into your visions and come along with you. Some of my cats do that. If I'm doing visionary work, there's one of them always turns up and comes along and his body's just completely crashed out of sleep. And he's trotting alongside of me, keeping an eye out on me and watching my back and I'm watching his. So anything like that that you come across that you find interesting, always take a step back first and, you know, look at the presentation, look at where it's come from, and then start to think more intelligently about how would this relate to me on the land that I live and what I do um, and who I am. I'm not somebody in Siberia. I've not grown up in that culture. But there's a truth in all tribal magic to nature because that's where tribal magic comes from. So look at the nature around you. Pay attention to the animals, to the insects, to the spiders in your house, things like that. Watch their behavior and you'll start to learn about them. And then through that, the doors will start to open. And that's when animals in spirit will start to work with you. Josephine, as well, earlier you mentioned, you know, about the importance of psychology. And this next listener question touches on that from Anonymous, who is asking and saying, where I live, there are a lot of evangelical and Pentecostal megachurches where the pastors do faith healings and exorcisms and claim that they're healing or exercising the, quote, demons of lust or greed, etc. What do you think, Josephine, is happening on a magical level here, or is it just a psychological thing? Oh, that's the parasite feeding frenzy. They always are, regardless of what religion it is. When you get that sort of, you know, vast amount of people coming together and you get people whipping people up emotionally and then doing these very dramatic healings and exorcisms in front of people that take five minutes and exercising the demons of lust and greed. Lust and greed are not demons. That's human shit. That's stuff that you have to take responsibility for and that you have to grow out of. It's not something you can exercise out of anyone any more than you can exercise stupidity out of somebody. It's psychological frenzy and manipulation for a start off. It's, it's very abusive, is that sort of behavior. But it's also a parasite feeding frenzy. And the parasites will open people up so that they have this amazing experience. And as soon as they open up to that, hump take their energy and eat it. It's gross. When I lived in Tennessee, I lived pretty close to one of those, and it was just disgusting. What shocked me the most, because I was used to, you know, growing up, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, you know, they were always at odds with each other. But in general, the people who went to church tried to be good people in general. And this particular mega church that I lived Close, not too close, but close enough. After they'd been in church, they'd go to the local restaurants. And I knew some of the waitresses in the local restaurants. The people that came out of the church were the rudest, nastiest, stingiest, arrogant, mm. just appalling behavior. And treating the waitresses like absolute shit, having them running around for three hours and leaving, you know, a table of 25 and they'd leave a dollar as a tip when that waitress only gets paid a dollar in an hour because their actual wage is the tips. And they know that. And it's, it's a power game. I always, you know, judge by the fruits. Those are the people coming out of that church. Well, that tells you a lot about that church. And they were like parasites because they were so parasitic. They just became parasites themselves. So, yeah, I've got a very low opinion of that sort of stuff. But, yeah, magically, it's just a parasite and feeding frenzy. Josephine, too, uh, you also mentioned earlier in a question from a listener about mental health, about uh, the importance of dancing the power out of you. And to that point, we have another listener question from Anonymous who is asking, do you have any experiences, Josephine, that connect magic and dance? I vaguely remember you saying a while ago something about offering your dance to a goddess or seeing that same pose performed by someone else. Magic and dance, yes and no. Not not in a formal sense, not in a sense that would be done by or with anyone else. It was my career was dance and I was a performer and a coach. But in a, a magical level, it was very personal. And I would weave power 
with dance. And it's a, a, still a very interesting thing to do. But in terms of my performance and, and life in dance, as a performer, there came a point where Sekhmet just turned around one day and said to me, out the blue, just this voice, give me your dance and I'll give you your voice. And at the time, I really didn't understand that. I thought she was talking about singing and really, I cannot sing. I am the worst ever singer. People would pay me to shut up if I ever sang in public. So that didn't make any sense. What it was, was that she gave me my voice for writing, which came much later. And after that, I stopped using dance with power so much. I stopped performing completely. I did carry on coaching because I needed to for my income for because I was raising two kids. And occasionally I'll, I'll dance in the kitchen for just for the sake of it when I'm cooking. But yes, I mean, that's, that's about as close as magical connection with dance. But it was always like that for me when I was a kid. I'd dance and I'd spin and I'd feel all this power kicking off. I didn't understand it, but it just felt good. Um, and did that for years. And so there is a way of working with the body, with dance and magic, but it's not something I would ever teach or even write about because it's so personal for me. Josephine, too, this theme of psychology is uh, weaving its way through the questions as well. Uh, Anonymous is asking, Josephine, what are your thoughts on Carl Jung's ideas of archetypes? and How does it relate to Quaria or your views of magic? A lot of modern Jungians view these as symbols in the collective unconscious, while your view recognizes actual spirits with their own agency. So anything to add on that? <laughs> uh, I just don't go there with psychology because it's such a mess. You know, it's you've got two completely different things going on there. Psychology and magic are two very different things. They're both valid in their own way, but they are two very different things. Yes, you can have the symbols in the collective unconscious, absolutely. That is not the same as spirits with their own agency. It's two completely different things. And the only way you can get to that is not by theorizing or debating it out with a Jungian is by actual experience to the point where you cross over a threshold where you realize this is not your own mind, this is something else. And that really only can be brought in by direct experience. Speaking, Josephine, of uh, direct experience and another theme that has popped up as well, we have another question for you on Ma'at. And Anonymous is asking and saying that you've spoken, Josephine, about the importance of Ma'at or justice. Throughout the world, Anonymous says, many people have conflicting or diametrically opposed views on what right and wrong, good or bad, just and, ju and unjust are. So how do we reconcile that our own concepts of good and bad, which we might feel strongly about, might not necessarily fit with what is actually justice? Well, that's an interesting one because, you know, the idea of what's right and wrong and what's just and unjust depends on what culture you come from. The surface, because that's not Mark, that's culture and language. What language you speak has a, a, a huge bearing on what you consider good and bad. What religious structure the nation grew out of has a huge influence on what you consider right and wrong, good and bad. And so you've got all these different nations all over the world and some have parallel ones and some have diametrically opposed ones. That's nothing to do with Mark. That's to do with society and how society works, because it often what's good or bad or considered good and bad and just and unjust are to do with how that society particularly works. And often it's quite unjust. You know, the, the morals and ethics come out of not only the religion and the culture, but the manip social manipulation Where's the hierarchy? Who's on the pecking order in the hierarchy? All of that. So, yeah, it, the one thing to come to the understanding of is that different nations will have different ideas about what is just and unjust, which has nothing to do with actual justice and balance. But understanding where that came from and how that developed helps you reconcile that that's how that nation works and it works for them. 
it wouldn't work for you. But that's their bag. That's not your bag. In terms of actual justice, which is rare, again, the understanding, which I spoke about before, comes from practicing it yourself. What somebody else does is their business. It's not your business unless it encroaches on you directly and does you damage. It's like the argument raging in the States at the moment about abortion rights. And, you know, there's a huge religious and philosophical and and ethical and medical and human rights and all that, all arguing and this, that and the other. And it boils down to it's not your business. At the end of the day, you live by your own justice and what is what you feel is smart is right. And you look at it and you completely absorb yourself in it and you evaluate it. As you go along, as you change and evolve, your understanding of justice and unjust starts to evolve. And you start to realize that it really isn't your business what somebody else does. 90% of the time, if it's not coming in, smacking you over the head or shooting you in the face, it's nothing to do with you. you. Start from ground zero all the time. And then when you see something that appears to be wrong, bad or unjust, but is accepted, look at why. What's behind it? Why is it actually there? What's the root of it? Where is it coming from? And then look at the manipulations of people on both sides that they're using in their language and how they're justifying yes or no. Where does that justification come from? And that's when you start to see that people have their pet pedestals and they will twist on both sides. They will twist information. They will twist scripture. They will twist science. They will twist everything to make their point. And you have to see that and you have to be aware of it and you have to be aware of it if you do it yourself as well. And look at what is actually, what is it doing to you? What is it doing to the wider society that is a mixed bag of all different religions and none? You know, it's people get too polarized and too wrapped up in all of this stuff and they don't think about themselves and they don't think about their own mark, their own right and wrong and how they behave themselves. And, you know, it fascinates me watching all of this going on, not just that issue, but much wider issues in society of, you know, people very polarised, they're wrong, the others are right, and, and we're the goodies and they're the baddies. And then you're looking at what these people are doing. It's like, how the hell do you justify standing up for the common good when you behave like a fucking animal? And that goes for any, any side. So bring the mind back from what's out there and bring it down to yourself. And that's how you will learn to reconcile different concepts in different parts of the world and, and around you as well and find your own balance within that. And also be aware of parasites that drive behaviors. You know, once you get these polarized goodies and baddies situations and, and hating each other, parasites always there because it's food. It's really good food and they're hungry and they have a right to eat. So they will find these places and these people and then they will feed them. They'll wind the person up more and more and more and more until they do something that jettisons a lot of energy that they can feed off of. So as a magician, you also have to look at it from that perspective as well. What is driving those people that are doing something that you feel is deeply unjust, but they think is right? not just parasites. We're in a destructive phase, <clears throat> which we've been in now for a while, and it's completely outed itself now. So it's right out there, and it's going to be right out here for a long time, is you've got very destructive beings flowing through individuals and groups of people. And it's like it blinds them and uses them. So you also have to be aware of that as well, not in a way of judgment, of just understanding, of just seeing what's happening and understanding what that process is going on. And then, you know, is it really infringing on you as an individual right now? No. Okay, well, you know, just don't watch it then. Is it infringing on the nation? That's a different matter for a magician. That's when you have to start to think of what your own capabilities are as a magician. What are you prepared to give 
of your life and your energy to bring and help bring change, which is a very, very big decision to make because people dive into that sort of stuff and don't realize actually this can be a 30 year job and it can suck your life away. This is why magicians used to work together in groups so that they could share out the load of the work. And if you're going to do that, how are you going to do it? Are you going to cut across democracy where people of, you know, a majority have chosen to go in a particular direction that you think is unjust? Well, you live in a democracy. That's how democracy works. If you don't like it, don't live in a democracy. Go live somewhere else that's, that's authoritarian. You don't destroy a whole structure of a nation and bring a nation to its knees because you don't think that those people are just or right. Can you see how just a simple, simple thing like that can spin right out, which is what's happening? And so when you ask a simple question like that, you're, it's actually opening up a huge vista, which you have to, as a magician, pull right back in and start again with ground zero. Are you just in everything you do? Very, very, very few people are ever achieve that. We all have some unjustness that we put out, which is why we're still evolving. We're still trying. We're still growing. Get yourself growing and evolving because that starts to then affect change around you. And when you think if something is bad or unjust, and it, especially if it's in a different culture of the ideas of good and bad, look at why, why was it there originally? Not why they're saying it's there now. Why was it there originally? You might have to dig for a long time to find out. Nothing it comes from common sense, but it's turned into a political or religious dogma that is used then as a social engineering to suppress so you start to see how some things evolved from a common sense thing into a very oppressive and unjust thing. That teaches you about Mark by looking at injustice and where it comes from and also looking at why you think it's unjust. Put yourself in that culture. You know, if it's about women, look at a country where women are treated very badly and then put yourself in the mindset of the man and then you'll start to understand where it came from. It's not saying that it's good and it's not saying that it's just. It's saying understand first what is driving that. Then you can start to understand Mart and chaos and then you can start to work within that. Well, Josephine, that is incredibly powerful. And this actually goes to another listener question that strikes on this theme of effectively ground zero and balance and really approaching things from your own felt experience. And uh, this listener question is from B and B is asking... Sometimes, Josephine, we have to devote more time than we would like to, quote unquote, mundane life and work, especially for those in professional fields and our magical practices can be slowed down substantially. So if this lasts for a while, coming out of a magical lull or even finding a center from which to proceed after downtime, this can be very challenging. This is especially true if work responsibilities intermittently continue eating up what would otherwise be free time. So B is asking, Josephine... What's your general advice for resurrecting a magical practice in a case like this and for finding balance generally when you have a job where this can happen periodically? It is a tough one. When you're working all the hours that God sends and you're a magician, it, it really doesn't leave you much time for specifically doing a magical working. I've been there myself when my kids were younger and now is you know, living in the States and having to work some, sometimes three jobs, sometimes two jobs, working 70 hours a week, it really doesn't leave you any time or energy to do anything else. And that's when you start to realise that a, it's probably not a good time anyway for you to be doing structured magic. That often hits in your fit where it's like, here, we're going to keep you busy for a while over there. So go do that for a year or two. And then it'll ease up. But it also teaches you how to bring magic through into your everyday life and your work. And that depends on what magic you've already learned, you know, what, what skills do you already have. But you find that you, you know, A, there's ebbs and flows with magic. 
it goes according to your fate, your energy, um, what's happening around you, all of these different things come together. And so there are downtimes and it can be very long downtimes where you just can't get there. It just isn't going to happen. And then there's times when you've got plenty of time. You learn to go with the flow. You know, don't, don't force things. In terms of when you're in a period where you, there is no time, if you're not in a period where you have to be undercover, which I've had a couple of times, it's like, here's a job. You're going to do it for 18 months. Keep your head down, shut up. Keep mundane. Just go do that job because it's a bridge to get you somewhere else. Okay. There's other times where there isn't that sort of a restriction, but you just don't have any time. Is magic anyway becomes a way of living. It becomes part of your life and everything that you do becomes magical. So, for example, one time when I was a waitress, you know, I'd be waiting tables and, you know, giving people their food, picking things up. And every so often I'd see someone come in and I, I'd see the heaviness on them. I'd see pain, I'd see stress, I'd see isolation, all these different things. And so I'd work magically. So when I'd go to the, t again, intent, focus and intent, I'd come into focus and I'd go up to them. And instead of saying, what do you want to order? I'd say, what can I do for you? And it's a magical utterance. And they sort of translate it of, oh, well, I'd like to order this, that and the other. But sometimes people are just bursting into tears. Mm. And I'd sit down with them and go, right, I've only got five minutes, but, you know, I'll get you good, some good food, but don't worry, it's going to be okay. And I'd hold a hand and what I'd be doing is not that I can fix their problems, but I could put energy into them. I could bridge a guardian to them. You know, there all these just, just very subtle ways, bringing the food to them, you know, somebody looking very depressed and, and withdrawn is as I was carrying the food, I'd be uttering very quietly of the food of feed, feed this person, uttering over the food very, very quickly, very gently, very quietly, heal, feed, energy, divine will, whatever. I'd be uttering with the food, put the food in front of them. Nothing that would ever alter their fate or interfere with their fate. You've got to be really, really, really careful that you don't intrude, you don't push but it's whatever they need, nourish this person because you can't solve their problems, but you can give them an island of nourishment. You can give them a little fragment of a catalyst for healing that will trigger or it won't. Once you've done it, that's it. You're bridging, that's all. Sometimes there'd be someone that come in that was just nasty just really nasty and would leak out all over the place. And as they went out the door, I had this brush, even though we used vacuums, I had this brush and I'd just make an excuse of brushing them out the door. Everything they'd left behind, I'd just brush it out the door, wipe it down, you know, and I'd put a bit of salt in the water and just, just wipe everything down. It's just get that energy out. See, so working magic and life together, you're bringing them together. Same with the ballet, teaching them how to find inner balance as they're finding out a balance. There's all these different ways. And, you know, if you're working on a keyboard, what is it you're working with? Can you mediate whatever's necessary? Is it something that helps people? Is Whatever. You find different ways depending on the skills you've already got, which goes back to don't wait to learn the skills. Learn the skills while you don't need to use them. Because then when the time comes along, you really will need them. You need to be up to speed with them. And doing this this way in very simple ways actually trains you because it's, it's almost like exercising. It's, it's keeping the muscle going. Little personal actions, walking down the road. You can do the same of sweeping energy as you're walking down the road, just collecting stuff and dumping it, opening a gateway, letting water through, all of these different things. We also have another listener question for you from B, who's asking more generally, Josephine, would you say a period where you cannot find time to do much magic, say for a few months or more, it's an indication that you need to do less magic or instead try harder to integrate your magical work with the rest of the components of your life? That really depends. Um, it can be either. It depends on the individual and it, it, not just on the individual, on the time. You know, no can mean a variety of things. It can mean 
don't do that. Just shut up for a while, you know, or it can mean no to the formed stuff, integrate it better. That you've to come to in your own way. You can use divination to find out. It's like, do I need to go into a dead zone? Yes. All right, then. Okay, I've got that. Do you need to go into a dead zone? No. Okay, well, then, you know, I'm going to have to integrate it and find ways to work with it. Again, coming back to those critical themes about balance and finding out what, what works for you. And Josephine B. is also asking, when working through a potentially difficult concept, for example, Aquaria module on death and the underworld or on destruction, how would you envision, Josephine, healthy integration of magic with everyday life playing out? Well, with the one with death and the underworld and destruction and stuff, our world today, uh, at least for us in most of Europe, not all of Europe, actually, Western Europe and, and the US, you know, death, destruction, that sort of thing is sanitized out of life. I mean, when I was a kid, you'd see, because there's always five generations alive in our family, and it's an Irish family, we breed like rabbits, so there's always somebody dying, is laying out bodies, washing the bodies. You know, if you're the kid, if you're the little kid, then, oh, can you go out and pick some flowers to put them on, on Granny's dressing table while we wash her down? So you're around the process. And we weren't protected in those days from destruction and things that were going badly wrong. It was all around you. And so you got used to that sort of thing being around. So there was no separation. When you come to magic, you can integrate it in, into your everyday life from really simple things like, did you just snuff out the life of a bug by accidentally treading on it? You know, that sounds, it's just so simple. But to that bug, it's not. You've just killed it. You didn't mean to. You didn't even see it. You weren't even aware of it. But it's death. And that's the end of it. And it also starts to teach you then about vast beings, vast angelic beings that are just not aware of you, that work with destruction, that come in with destruction, don't see you, they snuff you out like a bug. You start to really get concepts of size and how things just repeat down the levels right down to you and the bug. Death is around you all the time. Destruction is around you all the time. So... It's learning first how to be aware of that, how to not participate in that when it's not necessary. Like, you know, just be careful where you tread. You're still going to tread on bugs. It's impossible to not, but don't intentionally go out and kill something just because you don't like it or it looks horrible or whatever. Think about the beings that flow through these powers of death and destruction. Be aware of it outside in everyday life, it, we're right in the middle of a destructive cycle. It's huge. It's knocking out, you know, we've had pandemics, we've got war. We're now having economic collapse, which is also going to bring famine. You know, it just carries on. It, this, is, this is all around you. It's playing out all around you. So, you know, if you don't know what to do to integrate that magically, at least observe it be aware of it, see it playing out in everyday life. You know, if you're wanting to learn, use divination. You know, there's all this, look at Brighton. I mean, it's just everything is falling apart. You could do a big layout and say, right, show me the process of what's going on in that country and where is it taking that country to over a period of, say, 40 years or 20 years so that you're looking at that destructive process and seeing, beginning to understand and learn how all this sort of thing works and, and why. It's observance, everyday life. Just keep an eye, it's all around you. And where you're stuck in the middle of something where you can help and do something, then do so. But also use that time to be aware of your own fears around these sorts of things, because they are so heavily sanitized out of a lot of societies now, is look at it, be aware of it, don't be afraid of it, see why it's necessary. This is all magical learning. It's just by watching and observing. Josephine, too, a question from Kisa, who's asking, do you think, Josephine, it's possible to change the world and make it a better place with powerful magic like the magic that's found in Quaria, for example, 
helping get rid of greedy politicians? Well, the best way to make the world a better place is to kill all the humans off and then we have a better place, but then we're not there to enjoy it. So you got to be really careful what you ask for. You know, and it's not about being powerful magic. It's about being focused magic and, you know, changing the world. What does that mean? Do you mean changing the fate of the whole world or changing the fate of a nation, which is impossible Can you modify the fate of a nation? Well, technically, yes. You need to have the skills and the workers. What is the fallout from that? This is where the problems come in, is, you know, oh, I want to get rid of authoritarianism. It might be the fate of that nation for a while to go through that because, you know, for a start off, people that live in a democracy think that everywhere should live in a democracy. And it, the, the world doesn't work like that. It's one of many different social and political systems. And it isn't a one size fits all. That's the first thing is don't interfere in another nation because you just don't understand it. You work in your own nation. And, you know, you want to get rid of greedy politicians. You do magic to get rid of, rid of greedy politicians. They'll all go. Another set will turn up because that's just a symptom. It's not the cause of the problem. So you have to then work to find out what is the cause of the problem. So then you have to look at the social structure and you you have to look at the media. You have to look at misinformation. You have to look at truth and lies. You have to look at, uh, at greed, not just in politicians, but in society in general. So you start to see it's an overwhelming thing that you you really you know you what you can do is you can trigger the journey to balance but how that balance reaches itself and what that balance is you can't control and that is is the only safe way to do anything for a nation is is bring it into balance but that balance could mean a much smaller population for instance which means killing a load of people off so again don't dabble in magic that, that you don't understand in a democracy. It's like, you know, we're basically run by idiots at the moment here in Britain. A lot of the old fashioned conservatives are just looking at this going, what the hell is going on? Not, not just the opposing groups, but the actual party itself is looking at this, this group and thinking, well, what the hell? You can't target in on that. What you can do is work to bring truth, justice and balance but you bring that up to the surface, it's a democracy. So the people are given a choice. Truth, justice, balance, or greed and corruption. And sadly, a lot of people will go for the greed and corruption because that is the side, regardless of which political side, because they all have, they're all, they've all got their own problems. Lying, Brexit, the amount of barefaced lying that happened during that process on both sides. At the moment, the amount of lying and not truth, which is not the same as lying, they're just not people not saying what what is a full truth. The greed, the power, the need for power, all of that is all wrapped up and it's, it's entwined right the way down through the nation. So if you try and knock that out, once the people have chosen as a democracy, and they've gone for the greedy guys, there's nothing you can do about that without destroying the democracy itself. And if you destroy the democracy itself, you leave a vacuum. And what can fill that vacuum can be a lot worse than what was there to start with. That's why you don't interfere with this sort of thing. What will happen is you, you keep balance yourself. If you plant balance in the land, and then you just leave it and let things get on, is then, and which is what we're seeing now here, is that the younger ones are really questioning what's right and wrong and and not accepting the bullshit. And they will grow and mature. And you might have a situation where, you know, democracies do collapse anyway because a democracy wedded to the free market, basically, eventually, it becomes authoritarian or it collapses. I mean, that's just how it works when you look at at politics as a social construct. So you don't want to magically create a vacuum 
what you what you have to do is make sure that there's a foundation of choice and balance there for the younger generation who will organically create whatever is in that vacuum. There, there will be no vacuum. They will start to create. It could take generations, but they will create something. It's good. Society has to go through its processes. And the other magical answer to, for example, get rid of greedy politicians, first you start with yourself. Are you greedy? You know, what's your level of greediness? What's your level of power lust? These are hard questions we've got to ask ourselves when we look at things outside of ourselves like that is you're trying to get rid of the greedy people. Does that include you? That you really got to look in the mirror before you touch anything that's going to affect a nation, which that sort of magic would, and see if you're part of the problem first and see if the problem is so deeply rooted. Often it's a tiny catalyst that needs tweaking, not big, heavy, powerful magic. It's a tiny little catalyst that just lets the whole thing collapse. And often it's just balance. That little catalyst of balance will bring things up to a head like boils so they can be seen and choices keep being given to the people because it's a democracy and see where that goes and see how much rot needs to actually come out before this regeneration and the new trees grow. We also have a listener question for you, Josephine from Lila Eden, who says, I'm honored to be able to address Josephine and would like to first express my deep gratitude for her work and willingness to share her wisdom. I'm excited to hear about her upcoming projects. My first question is, we humans often talk of ourselves as something separate from nature. We are this separate entity intruding on, displaced from, or at odds with nature. If the truth is that we are part and parcel of nature... Why do you think, Josephine, this sense of separation occurs? And are we humans unique in our ability to trigger unnecessary destruction? Well, the sense of separation comes from modern living and commercialism and living in big cities and in apartments and kids having their time overmanaged and not growing your own food and fast-paced jobs, which is all necessary. You know, that's it. Um, everyone thinks because... People in the West live like that, that the rest of the world does. The rest of the world doesn't live like that uh, for the most part. And, you know, there's very large areas around the world still where people are not at odds with nature. That separation is relatively modern. I certainly didn't grow up with that. But it becomes a loud voice that everyone then thinks is right. And, oh, we are separate. Well, no, you're not separate. Do you choose to be separate? If you choose not to be separate, then get out in nature and grass verge. It's grass, it's nature. Bird in the sky, it's nature. Start the connections. But the separation is very much about we live in a fast-paced free market society that is all about consuming product. So our focus through media, films, society, everything is on consuming and nature doesn't get a lock in with that because all nature does is provide for that consuming. So just understand that that's where it comes from and take a step back because it is pretty modern depending on where you came from. You could go to areas in Ireland where that separation absolutely does not exist. You could go to places in France, absolutely doesn't exist. You have to look at where the question comes from within you first and then look around you and see where isn't that separation and look at where did that separation start in a society. Are we unique in our ability to trigger unnecessary destruction? You know, I don't know. I've never thought about that and I can't give you an answer to it because I don't know, but I will certainly chew on that one and have a look. Josephine, we also have another listener question from Lila Eden who is asking, Josephine, if after death we must let everyone go, as mentioned in the section on death vision, and it's best for both ourselves and our life partners that we move on, understanding that we might not ever encounter them again in another form, one may come to a moment where they think, well, why have a deep connected partnership at all? Why have anything in this life that I develop some attachment to? So Lila's asking, what are your thoughts, Josephine, on partnerships in life? I'm thinking mostly of long-term life partners, but obviously this could be applied to other relationships. 
Is it a means of learning the spiritual lesson of letting go? Is it a means of souls to support each other's spiritual development and navigation of this weird manifest world? Or just a way to share joys, sorrows, wisdom? My belief system, Lila says, does not include a post-mortem flower field where I'm reunited with all of my loved ones. I've mostly come to accept this with the exception of the inevitable loss of my husband. I can't seem to push further into gnosis. Contemplating this eventual loss remains devastating. Great. Well, you're assuming that he's going to die before you do, for a start off. You know, you could get knocked over by a bus tomorrow. You don't know. The other thing that, you know, as we've been talking about society and, and cutting off from things is you really just don't know. And things come and go in your life. That is normal. That is how the world works. Everything works that way. So you really do have to learn to let things go. And you start with very small things, which is part of the early quarrier training is learning to let go of certain things. Because without that, you can't, that's why you can't push further into gnosis because you can't, you're not able to let anything go. Therefore, a conversation can't start. And, and I really feel for you because that is a, a horrible state to be in. Sometimes that fear is cultural, but really it's an example of growing up in a stable world that has medicine, that has food, that has money, all of these different things, which is really, you know, the last 40, 50 years, the first generations that had that. I mean, you know, as I was saying earlier, big family, a funeral every two years, getting used to washing bodies down, you know, losing friends over the last two years with the COVID pandemic. I lost quite a few friends, some of which who, you know, I know we've argued about vaccines and things like that, but listening to someone trying to say goodbye where they can't breathe and they're going and being put into a coma, which they didn't come out of, is absolutely horrible experience to go through. So if anybody ever stands in front of me and says, oh, that's all made up, you know, they just want you to get this vaccine because they want to do mind control, I would take their fucking face off because of the suffering that I went through, that they went through, of having to let, you know, not just let go, but be there as, as that person was dying. And um, people in my family, my friends, people who have been badly damaged by this, this virus. And so we're in a period of letting go. So it really is something you have to practice. If you want to move forward in Gnosis and Magic, you really do have to practice in very, very simple everyday ways because it's something you exercise because you're not used to it. In terms of, you know, relationships and why do we have relationships? Well, then this is then stepping out of your own time and looking back just two generations. People had relationships and partnerships and, and marriages because that's how you survived. And it had very little to do with love for the most part you would sometimes develop a deep attachment to that person. Sometimes you wouldn't. Sometimes you were trapped in a loveless and hateful marriage, which was awful. So now we have choices, but it wasn't all love and light and, and long-term partners. All of this keeps in your questions. What they're all circling around to is not knowing how to let go of things. So everything, spiritual development, navigating the world, long-term partners, all of that is first you need to let go and, and find a very, very simple way to do that. We also have, Josephine, a, another listener question for you from Lila Eden, who is asking and saying, disclaimer, this comment is not meant to oversimplify substance abuse disorder, and I hope it will not be received as insensitive by anyone who has struggled with substance abuse. The circumstances surrounding overuse of any substance are complex and many. And Lila says, I'm a public health nurse and I observe many parallels unfolding between balance and magic and balance of the body. One such example comes from working with folks who are living with a long-term addiction to methamphetamine. This is a drug that produces feelings of well-being and can increase energy levels for many hours at a time with long-term overuse. We begin to see the unraveling effect this has on the body's systems. 
This has made me think a lot about your teaching, Josephine, that nothing we do in magic is free. Mediating power or doing work to produce a specific effect is never done in a vacuum. Everything has a price. We may immediately feel the effects or the unraveling may begin slowly, only to speed up as we continue along our path. You spend a lot of time, Josephine Lila says, teaching your students the importance of weaving in loss slash giving and other strategies for counterbalancing what we receive to mitigate this unraveling. Can you, Josephine, comment a bit about this dynamic, perhaps more recent insights you've had to avoid making you repeat what you've already written about extensively? Well, Lila, you're automatically assuming that doing magic is going to unravel you. That's not the case, and you've misunderstood that. Magic that's done in an unbalanced way or by a person that's heavily unbalanced will start to unravel them, yes. But, you know, magically working in a magical balanced way doesn't unravel you. It might loosen if you're too tight. The the unraveler power can trigger a bit to loosen you off if you're too tight. It can tighten you up if you're too loose. I don't understand, again, how you've got to that conclusion. But magic doesn't happen in a vacuum, but also magic can happen in stupidity or it can happen in intelligence. And when you start mediating power, you work from a place of intelligence where you understand it's not that it has a price. You understand what you're doing. You adapt to it according to your own body and mind. And you work from that space of adaptation with the beings that are around you. Now, for 90% of magic, all that means is that sometimes you get a bump in the road. You might get a pulled muscle, this sort of thing, from a magical perspective. If you're doing really heavy stuff, like you know, writing the course, that sort of thing, that is a huge burden. And what that can do is push you. The unraveling is when it's completely out of balance. The grindstone is where you're working and you're you're really carrying heavy loads. It's not about payment or taking. You've mixed up what's going on there. You've taken two completely different things and somehow put them together in your mind. So there is no analogy with math and magic unless you've got someone who's doing playing with magic at a heavy level in a really stupid way um, and doing that for a long time, then, yeah, you will get, over a long period of time, a complete unravelling of that person. But that's not normal. Just as being a heavy meth addict is not everyone. So it's not about whether magic is free or whether you pay for it. Think more in terms of magic as being a mountain climber or a gymnast. You have to train for it. You have to build strong muscles. You have to have the right equipment. You need to know what you're doing. You do that. It's very hard work. You're exhausted when you finish, but you've done it. That's more how it works. We also have a listener question, Josephine, for you from Andrew Nichols, who is asking and saying, I live and work on the West Coast of Australia in places whose colonial history is particularly recent and raw even by Australian standards. This includes spending much of my working time in the remote Northwest, which was the last part of the continent to be colonized and where many elderly Aboriginal people still remember encountering non-Indigenous people for the first time in the mid-20th century. I was born here, Andrew says, but am of English heritage and therefore often feel a strong sense of, quote, imposter syndrome when trying to engage with the spirits of this place and... I'm very aware of the horrendous legacy that colonialism has left in terms of disrupting and actively trying to sever the connection between the traditional owners of this land and the places of whom they were the sole custodians for over 60,000 years until a bunch of English people barged in a mere two centuries ago and tried to wipe them all out. I wonder, Andrew's saying, if Josephine has any suggestions about appropriate ways for me to approach spirits of place who may be inclined to feel hostile towards me based on my connection to this colonial history. 
Aboriginal spirituality is closely guarded for good reason, and it's not at all appropriate for me to seek any kind of initiation into any of these traditions. I would never ask and would refuse if I did, though I do listen and learn as much as I can when Aboriginal friends and colleagues offer insight. But I'd be keen to hear whether Josephine has any thoughts about how I can approach local spirits in a way that lets them know that I'm trying to be respectful and I'm doing my best to make amends. Land spirits are like cats. You put out food, they turn up. Don't try and go out and make contact. Let them come to you. And the way to do that is, you know, if you're in a place where you have a garden, make sure that the garden is for the garden and not for you. It's not there to look pretty. It's there for plants that come from that land to have space to exist. Because often, you know, in built up areas, it all ends up being pretty flowers that come from all over the place. And they're of no use to any insect or anything. So first thing you do is you plant the flowers and plants and herbs and bushes that need to be there, that should be there. And you put out food for the birds. You put out water. You start with the animals themselves and the birds and the insects. Although in Australia, if I remember rightly, everything eats your face off over there. So you might have to be a bit careful with that. (laughs) If you're in an apartment, you obviously can't do that. So, you know, make a point of if you can once a week, choose a place where it's away from the houses, where it's out in nature, where it's safe for you to go. And we're not intruding on anything. And just go there and sit. Take something with you. Maybe take a flask of water and and a bowl. Put a bowl of water out for the birds or for any creature that's there if they need it, if it's dry. Take a gift, maybe some honeycomb that you leave in a tree for the creatures or the insects. If there's a river there, you go sit by the river and you talk to the river. You Hello. Wow, you are really beautiful. I'm sorry I'm ignorant, but I just think you're amazing. Is there anything I can do? Have a look around you. Is there any trash that you can pick up? You see how it's, you know, you're going in carrying all this psychological baggage, which should be there, but mustn't overtake you and stop you doing the right thing. So what you need to do is first let the spirits know that you're there. And that let them know you can't tell them you're a decent person. You need to show them you're a decent person. And the way that you do that with land spirits is look after the land because that's what they are. They're the spirits of the land and of the birds and of the trees. So you look around. Does trash need picking up? Do things need planting? Take some food out. Make sure that it's not something that's good, like chocolate or anything like that that's going to poison which is why honey, honeycomb always goes down well with everything and everyone. Take some honeycomb out, leave it at maybe in a tree or at the base of a tree. Talk to the tree, tell, you, tell the tree why you put the honey there. Talk in your mind as well as your voice. Or if there's people around, just talk in your mind. Talk to the river, look for the crap, look around you, sit and meditate and keep going back. Keep going back and so they start to recognize you. And then you take it from there and see what happens. It's a long process. But doing that, of re- you know, letting spirits realize that, you know, you're not there because you want something. You're there because you want to be there and you want to be part of the land there. So, you know, go in with respect, not for what you can get out of it. And just have a very open and truthful heart. And if you do talk to anyone that's, any of the Aboriginal community, just say, you you know, is there anything I'd be doing wrong if I came once a week to sit here by the river and talk to the river and maybe give some honeycomb to the trees and feed the birds or anything like that? Is, Is there anything with that that I'd be doing wrong? So you're not asking what should you do. You're asking what you shouldn't do and just leave it at that. You know, you're just wanting to make friends with the land and then just see where it goes. It's not about learning knowledge or learning skills with land powers. It's about being a decent person, going out there and being useful 
And that's what's recognised, not the ancestral baggage, but who is the person there. And then what eventually, as a magician, you might get to a phase at some point where that ancestral baggage has to be confronted because of a magical working that the land needs. And that's when you have to face the collective responsibility. So it's not about get out clauses either, but that needs to come from the land. The land needs to, spirits will turn around at some point and you'll realise that something that they're asking of you is to do with this baggage. It need, there might be something that needs cleaning out from an energetic point of view or whatever they need. So do it that way. Josephine, I, I think Andrew's uh, last question here continues this theme of maintaining respect and proper engagement. And Andrew is asking, Josephine has talked on the podcast in the past about the potential dangers of depicting spirits in artworks and in having figurative slash representational artworks in one's home that could potentially act as gateways into the domestic space. I'm an artist, Andrew says, and a lot of my work comprises figurative, though symbolic, representations of deities and spirits. So I wonder if Josephine can elaborate on this any further. I'm assuming that Josephine's previous comments were likely directed at practitioners who are far more advanced than I am, but I'd love to hear a bit more about this to keep in mind as my magical practice continues to develop alongside my art practice. This is an interesting one that would link into the the previous question. Yeah, faces can be a problem. They're not always a problem, but they can be. This is also the problem when I'm giving advice. If I need to give advice about a negative thing, you say, oh, you need to be aware of that. Suddenly that becomes all oh, dangerous and we must never do that. No, <laughs> it's like complexities. Put it in context. You were talking about wanting to connect with the spirits on the land where you are and that your genetic line does not come from there and that there's a whole lot of baggage that goes with it of, of abuse um, and genocide. So with that in mind, and you were saying you're doing representations of deities and spirits, what deities and spirits are you representing on that land? This is where you have to start being careful now because you can't do Aboriginal art because that would be insulting to the Aboriginal community. If you're doing other deities from Egypt, Mesopotamia, wherever, then on a wild land like Northwest Australia, and especially as a magician and an artist, you know, you're know you Im imposing again. It's like magical colonialism and it can be. It's not always that way. But when you bring certain things together, like being out in the area where you, where you are and all of that that comes with that, along with the history of both the indigenous groups and the invaders, and the fact that, you know, often the deities have nothing to do with either of them. Be very careful about that because A, it's just rude, and B, it can cause all manner of difficulties. It's not disastrous, it's just fucking rude and uncomfortable. What you could do, however, which would go back to your previous question, is figurative art that's, you know, as you say, it's, it's looser, it's symbolic, is go out in nature, like I said, and then start to paint for them. Give them a face. How, do, not what, how you think they should look. How do they want to look? Spirit of a tree. Does it need to look like a tree? Let it look like itself. How does it see itself? Does it need eyes? Does it need to come into your space? Are you, are you inviting it into your space? So doing magical art of creating windows for the land spirits if they want to come through those as vessels. So that's something for you to take away and think about. Josephine, we have a final listener question for you from Amy D. And Amy is asking and saying, Greetings, Josephine. I admire your spirit greatly and sincerest thanks for creating and sharing the course with the world. Amy says, I grew up having a very fractious relationship with my father. We had many years of not speaking, and when we would speak, there would be explosive rage at the drop of a hat. In my later years, Amy says, I realized that he was very inclined to magical thinking, though he hid it well. 
I would talk to him about things I was practicing and researching. A new respect was formed, although we kept up the old explosive patterns. And earlier this year, at the age of 34, dad became very ill. I helped my mom look after him at their home, but at the moment of his death, she was out and it was just him and I in the room. I had the feeling in that moment that I was a midwife in reverse and that I was guiding his soul out of his body. It felt like the unweaving of the pattern between us and the experience changed me profoundly. I am still digesting what it meant. So my question is this, do you, Josephine, have any recommendation of practice or research for me based on the above experience? I am someone who is moving at a snail's pace through the Quaria course, and I am still in module one. Thank you. Really, the experience that you had will teach you more than reading a book, which is something that for any powerful stuff like this, it's the actual doing it that teaches you. And you were put in that situation like I was there for my mother. It's the same same sort of thing. There's two ways you can approach it. There's a lot of stuff about midwifing the soul. A lot of it is new age dressing. There's some useful little bits and bobs, but most of it is eye rolling. That's more about making you feel good about what you do rather than it actually being useful. There probably is a lot out there, actually. It's just I don't know about it. I'm not aware of it, to be honest. So you could have a look around, but it is a thing, is midwifing the soul. But what you can also do if you're still trogging your way through module one is if you get to the stage, the lesson where you're moving around, you're learning to move around in vision, first in your house and then going outside. When you do that, Go outside and as you, you walk, walk along the street or walk around the house or whatever, is as you're walking, and it would be difficult for you to hold the focus of it, but as you're walking, just say, I've gone through this with my dad. If anyone else needs it, if anything else needs it, I'm trying to learn, so I'll be willing to help. And it's like you put the call out there. And where you come across a dying bird, you know, creature, something like that. Just be there. Stay with them. Bring them home. Be with them. Give them a space. Work with them. Later on in the course, you will slowly come across various stuff to do with death. You could look forward as well. Look into the course. I mean, you won't understand a lot of it from the actual practice because you've not got there yet, but you you might find some useful things and it's dotted throughout the course So, and I I did that intentionally with a lot of the powerful stuff is like, there is not just one chapter or one lesson on this. It's all over the place. So look through the contents listing, look at stuff like destruction, look at the modules on destruction and creation, because those are just as relevant to this sort of work. Look at the death stuff. Look at all of that. Look at the Assyrian stuff that's in the Adept Cup section again a lot of it will go over your head but some of it will go in and be helpful and then look around and see out out in the world what there is about working magically with death and with midwifing um souls visionary wise and stuff like that and what will happen is is that you will start to develop and learn and it might become something that you do or it might become something that fills something within you and then you go off to do something else But, yeah, I mean, you've learned more just from doing, just from being there than you would have done from a book. Author, occultist, magical teacher, tarot expert, so many other things. It's too numerous to name. Josephine McCarthy. Josephine, thank you, as always, just for taking the time and sharing your wisdom and your guidance on the podcast today. Thank you. And thank you for for having me and putting up with me. I really appreciate it. Well, listeners, there you have it. Josephine McCarthy's insights and her deep experiences are a needed gut check, no matter the esoteric paths that we find ourselves on. A huge thanks to Josephine for stopping by the podcast and a huge thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on patreon.com slash Glitch Bottle. It is your support of the podcast. That's the only reason the show grows in new and interesting ways. 
Thank you so much for your questions. And if you'd like to hop on the Glitch Bottle Caravan, please consider becoming an exclusive supporter of the show as well on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Mm-hmm.